Uh, how is everybody doing? I'm a little fried myself, but I'm happy to be here. Um, I just, I did a panel earlier today through Pacifica on, uh, it was a weekend on psychedelics. And we did a panel on spirituality and religion. And it was very, it was a lot of fun. It was a, a good crew. I'm not sure if they're going to make the recordings available afterwards, but I'll definitely let people know. I'm going to, if you, if you don't subscribe to my uh, Substack Burning Shore, I would say you, it's probably worth it. Just it's, it, I only put out a couple of months uh, just, but I also, but I, I usually put out any announcements or events that I'm doing or things like that. So if you like what I do, I just put the the link uh, in the chat. Um, so hopefully they'll make it available. I thought it worked out pretty well. I'm real. I'm really trying to do these things where I like, I like make a conversation happen, like rather than just like, okay, you say your piece and then you say your piece, like really sort of force a conversation. I think it worked, uh, worked pretty well. Um, interesting things coming up, you know, about what's the value of religion uh, when we, when we think about psychedelics, is there a value, you know, some of us have a real resistance to religion around, I'll be talking more about this after we do a, mm -hmm. we do a sit because I'm, I'm interested in thinking about authority and, uh, uh, independence as a, a dynamic in practice, uh, and, you know, how, what a conundrum it is and um, how, how it's playing out in the psychedelic space and the spiritual space um, and how, what that, how, how the kind of my idea of a Dharma knot sort of negotiates uh, that tension. But uh, yeah, let's wait a couple more, couple more minutes. Um, I'm doing, I'm also putting together or I'm involved in another uh, conference that will be in April through uh, Shakruna. If you don't know about Shakruna, it's a, it's a groovy institution centered here in San Francisco. Um, and they do really interesting work. They have a, a really good website with good, good quality content and they run conferences, kind of an educational mission. Uh, and what I really like about Shakruna, especially right now, is that they're, they have like one foot in the sort of research and clinical space, well, let's say three feet, they have three feet, one foot in the clinical research space, one foot in social justice and one foot in kind of like anthropology, like the, she, the, the, the leader Bia Labachi is an anthropologist, which is a, I find a sympathetic approach to these things. So they do pretty cool content and I'm on the board and I've been getting a little bit more involved with them. And right now we're planning a, uh, a conference on religion and psychedelics, which is a, a, a seeming to becoming a, a, a theme for me um, and we're doing that uh, for April 22nd, I think it's one of the days of the weekend. Um, and, you know, I'll, I'll let you know more about that. I'm putting together a couple of panels. It's, it's pretty interesting kind of work. And then I also found out I'm going to be doing a, um, I'm not sure whether it's going to be over Zoom or in person. I'm hoping in person, but uh, along with my friend and colleague, Christian Greer, I'll be doing a sort of intensive on religion and psychedelics through the Harvard Divinity School and their um, Center for the Study of World Religions program, which is a cool program. If you're interested in this kind of stuff, they do like pretty high level, but accessible scholarly stuff about new religions. And they've been concentrating a lot on psychedelics recently. And they do weird stuff on mysticism. They just started a program on transcendence. So they're looking at aspects of religious experience that haven't typically gotten the kind of attention you would expect from a place like Harvard divinity school. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to that. And part of the idea on that one is it's, it's kind of less for people who are really into the topic. And it's more for all of the kind of increasing, increasingly wide range of professionals, neuroscientists, clinicians, psychologists, even entrepreneurs, who are going into the psychedelic field. And they, you kind of realize somewhere along the line that like, the religion and spirituality and mysticism have a lot to do with what's going on, but a lot of people don't know shit about that stuff. And so it's kind of like, let's, let's pack in a lot of like material and ways of thinking about this stuff that uh, offers a kind of bridge between people who are really devoted to this material or are seekers or who, or who really understand 
mysticism and shamanism and things like that versus people who are just sort of being turning on to psychedelics for whatever reason and realizing that they're now in this new world where they at least have to have kind of a clue. So that's, that's a goal we're doing there. Uh, and, and that should be fun. I think we're doing that in January. We're just setting up the information there. And again, I'll, I'll, I'll put all the, I'll include all this stuff on the, the burning shore when I know, uh, specifics. Um, but I think I'm just going to uh, start, start off here with the meditation. Usually I talk first and then we do a sit, but I'm just feeling a little bit, uh, different for that. So, you know, if you want to turn off your camera or sit on the ground or whatever you want to do, just, you know, make sure you're, you're feeling good. It's nice to not have the screen in your face. And I'm, I'm just going to, uh, just to kind of seed it a little bit is that I'm playing with a way of uh, approaching stillness, kind of using the body. So obviously we'll begin with the body and settle into your seat. You know, if you can make sure your uh, back is supporting itself, not leaning against the back of the chair. Have your hips rolling forward just a bit. Really helps balance the spine so it can sort of rest on itself like a stack of plates or blocks. Allow that settling to occur in the pelvis. You can almost sort of draw your attention up your settling spine to the point where your skull begins. Gently push the back of your skull back, tucking your chin ever so slightly so it opens the back of your neck. Tug again ever so slightly at the top of your skull. So your spine is open, not tense, but open and spacious, kind of dangling in space, resting on its own integrity. And then ever so slightly open your chest and allow your shoulder blades to melt down the back. It's an uncomfortable movement. You can even kind of exaggerate it for a moment just to sort of get a sense of it and then allow that exaggeration to calm down and remain a, a sort of gesture towards the open chest. I find all these very useful, but particularly the open chest, it, it creates a sort of not just energetic, but emotional state so that encouraging our bodies to be upright, we are also encouraging ourselves to be upright in spirit. Clear, open, strong, balanced within, not leaning on anything. And now shift to the breath. Just breathe naturally and to begin, you can rest your attention anywhere that is most available, the nose, back of the throat, the chest, pit of the stomach. Let's just collect some of our attention now on the breath. For some reason, this just popped in my head. Uh, I'm, I suspect some of you know this and others may not. 
uh, one extra support for both the posture and for the concentration of the breath is to ever so slightly tighten your perineum. So, you know, right down in the depths, just a slight tightening as if holding back urination. Again, as slight as possible. It sounds a little weird, uh, but when you integrate it into your breathing, you will find that uh, it helps create a, an energetic container that can be very helpful and subtle. So rest on the breath. Again, if you feel any agitation or stray thoughts, restlessness, just let it ride your exhale out of your, out of your body. As your concentration deepens, allow the point of your focus to descend gently to the bottom of your belly, the furthest reach of your inhale and exhale. And if your breath is shallow, don't force it, but see if you can just open up uh, the middle of your body so that the breath is allowed to fully penetrate uh, the belly. If you're having trouble concentrating or getting settled, one little trick is to ever so slightly slow down the exhale, not forcing it, not restricting it, but allowing it to slow down the ever so slight hint of not a sound, but a, a kind of pressure. If you've done yoga, a very slight ujjayi breath can help. Not necessary, but if you're restless and your breath is short, it can help melt and integrate.
And I want to get as still as we can. So let's just stay with the breath uh, in our belly. And you're not so much sp specifically finding the details in the breath now. You're really just resting in this area that is being pointed out by the breath as it moves in and out. So in a way, it is more about a sort of warm spot at the bottom of the breath, in the back of the belly, or just below the belly. And just find the spot that feels right. It doesn't have to be exact. And rest there as you breathe. As we settle in here, you're welcome to try and experiment a bit, both with applying that slight throat lock on the breath on the exhale and on applying the slight clench of the perineum. You can see whether it makes a difference. Sometimes there's a subtle quality of fullness or integrity to the concentration with these very slight gestures that you want to be as relaxed as possible. So there's something that's not full relaxation, but is nonetheless deeply relaxed. Become intimate with this area in your belly. Perhaps you uh, feel a kind of energy there, a quality of warmth. Uh, if you're very visual, you might sort of associate it with a, a kind of light or fullness. So by now, rather than following the coming and going of the breath, it's like you've discovered a sort of deeper thread, a continuous presence in the belly, beneath the breath, touched by the breath, but more invariant. If that doesn't quite make sense, just follow the breath at the base of the belly and see if you can open up that feeling into a sense of a uh, kind of placement, a kind of uh, zone of energy or warmth and rest there.
if it's hard to find, you can imagine that your breath is almost like uh, uh, when you're blowing on the embers of a fire and you're slowly blowing and the coals are getting hotter and redder. It's like the breath itself is opening up the space, energetically stimulating it. Whatever exactly it feels like, and you can investigate it, warm, broad, tiny, vibrating, whatever it feels like, try to just boil down to the feeling itself, that it is feeling. that doesn't make sense, just rest in whatever is making itself present. But what you're tuning into is that you are feeling. There's not a void there. There's something like feeling. It is like when you put your finger on a surface, like your pillow or chair, you just rest it, you don't move it, nothing's happening, but there's a sense of contact and continuity in the feeling. Once you know what the texture is, you don't register it anymore. It's not as important as the contact itself. It's that sense of contacting your own feeling that you are opening up in your attention. And it might wander, it might not stay in the belly. You might notice feeling throughout your spine or through your legs, but in all cases, it's less about where or even the quality of the feeling than just, it's like the circuit is on. Your mind is the finger in the circuit of your own feeling. You might notice that it takes in more and more this current of feeling. Other sensations, other qualities of heat or energy. And if you can allow it to do so. Any tactile quality you have right now, even the feeling of air over your lips or an itch in your upper shoulder, all of those tactile feelings can be melted into this current as if it were one feeling in multiple forms. Try to tap into that one feeling.
there's so much variation in sensation all day long, sights and sounds and tastes and touch. But in a way, it all rests on some fundamental current of feeling. If this is still elusive, you just remain with the meditation. But if you feel a strong sense of continuity, a kind of feeling behind the sensation or a current animating the sensation, you can try to mix another sense gate into this feeling. You might know which one works for you. I find hearing the most interesting. So whatever sounds occur, not so much my voice, but when I shut up, see if you can allow those feelings to merge with this current. Allow the sensation, the sound, the event of the sound, not the sound itself, the event of the sound in your sensorium to become one with this current of fundamental feeling. that made sense nifty if not don't worry about it stay with the sense of this current like a signal or a single nerve that all sensation rides upon and see if you can find stillness within that current, as if whatever variation of sensation is coming in with its sense of dynamics and diversity is all resting on one still event, an ongoing, non-moving response.
And finally, in whatever way makes sense, let go even of this uh, core current, this baseline sensation, not with force, but allow it to sort of melt into the field of your mind, which is now so intimate with this underlying stillness and sensation, that sensation itself can begin to dissolve. And even if it does not dissolve, it is the mind resting intimate that is the space of your encounter. And if any sensations arise, random sound, a flux of feeling, just notice, does it feel a little different? Is, it, is there something behind or under it that has a different temporality, different quality of being an event? No problem if not but you might notice a subtle change. So we'll just rest a, a few more minutes and then I'll ring the bell. All right, folks, we're back. Try not to overuse the wah-wah effect, but it's, it's hard not to, because it's such a cool. <laughs> it's not the same over Zoom. <laughs> no, I know. It's really good live, though. I think you've, 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 you've played with this, Ben. <laughs> um, all right, well, thanks for your attention. Uh, Part of the reason I, I sort of set this up or, or, or described it the way that I did, I've been working with this lately, just exploring it on my own. And again, if you're new, I have kind of a sandbox approach here, which is sort of like, let's just go in there and sort of poke around and, and try things out uh, rather than presenting a sort of sy systematic approach. 
Um, I'm just going to assume that all of you have access to those kinds of teachings or have spent time doing that kind of work. And um, that's not, not so much what I'm interested in. I'm kind of interested in people learning how to play uh, and giving themselves permission to kind of explore. And so I'm, do, I'm like exploring these things, seeing if I can articulate them, you know, taking experiences that I've developed sort of not very verbally myself and then go, hmm, can I articulate this? Can we see what happens when articulation and practice come together and uh, see if something happens? But, you know, part of it's inspired by things about sound. Like, I mean, there's just such an extraordinary range of sound, just even recordings. Just think of all the, ex the extraordinary range of things that are on your recordings, your, your, your MP3s or FLAX or vinyl or cassettes or whatever it is, CDs. And all of those sounds can effectively be reduced to a single waveform. How is that possible? So much variety, so much timbre, so much complexity. Uh, and in a way, something I believe is similar with our sensation and that if you will allow yourself to tap into the feeling, almost the current upon which all of these sensations ride, there's a way into stillness or a kind of stability of attention, even in the midst of a lot of diverse events. So it becomes a kind of sensation driven way to get to stillness or to more fundamental senses of space and continuity uh, rather than the kind of like leaving everything alone and like letting, you know, or drawing your attention always onto a single object. Um, it allows for a sort of, I don't know, more open approach to sensation in some way. So I hope that was valuable. Um, it's not particularly linked to what I wanna talk about, uh, but before I start talking about that, and leading into discussion. And again, what for when we come to discussion, um, we'll turn off the recording so people can feel free to talk about whatever. You can talk about, ask questions about your own trips or psychedelic things, whatever it's, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm open to whatever, you don't have to stick on topic. Uh, but I just allow anybody to, if you had any reflections on our questions about um, the practice which, which we just did, if you don't, no big deal. I just wanted to let people say anything if they wanted to. All righty. Well, the thing that I wanted to talk about is I suspect maybe a few of you know, maybe more than a few, but there, were, there was a, an interesting article that came out, or two articles actually, that came out recently that sort of rippled through the uh, psychedelic intelligentsia. And they were both uh, by a, th a therapist named Will Hall. And I'll put the links in the chat. So you're welcome to go read them. One is a personal account of what Hall calls a kind of psychedelic therapy abuse. And one is a more sort of um, he's, he's also, uh, you know, st uh, studying therapy and, and working towards this himself. So he's also presents a kind of model of, or a, a conceptual idea about some of the problems with psychedelic therapy and ideas around psychedelics. So he's pretty critical of uh, not so much of psychedelics themselves, but of the way they are becoming organized as part of therapy culture, both official above board mainstream therapy and underground therapy. And one of his arguments is that if you go back and really do your psychedelic history, you find that there were warnings about psychedelics and therapy going back to the 1950s, particularly with uh, an early enthusiast named Sidney Cohen, who it is true, later came to the conclusion that these things were kind of dangerous not as groovy as they seemed initially. And so while not being a hater, um, was much less enthusiastic uh, by the time of the early 1960s. Um, and so this fellow's argument is really like, this stuff is, is really easy to abuse. And so he goes through and he talks about 
uh, other stories that we've known with MDMA um, and with uh, other psychedelics where there was clearly some kind of sexual abuse or there was some kind of other um, problematic ideas reaching back into the crazy 1970s, you know, when there were forms of psychedelic therapy that were insane, you know, like uh, 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 there's a, a Mexican psychotherapist, I think he was an official psychotherapist named Roquette. Um, and he was a, a curious character. Uh, and he believed in kind of, uh, if you've ever seen Clockwork Orange, um, you know, there's that part of Clockwork Orange where they take him and they keep his eyeballs open and they subject him with you know, ferocious images and sounds. And Roquette was kind of a fan of this approach to psychedelic therapy, which is that you essentially just overwhelm people with extreme imagery and sound until there's a kind of breakthrough event. And, you know, this kind of therapeutic idea was very popular in the late 60s and early 70s. You know, it's kind of overwhelming. You break things down and then something new happens. And we've moved on from that, but there's still aspects of that lingering. Uh, lingering around. Uh, and then uh, Will tells his own personal story. And I know of the therapists that he talks about, but I don't know them and I don't have any stake one way or the other in defending them or not defending them. Um, I find there's aspects of his account that are, that set off certain warning bells in my mind about how to take people's claims. But I'm, I have no doubt that the basic scenario that he's describing um, is, is true, even if I don't agree exactly with his uh, interpretations. But this has caused a big thing, right? And, what, and why I wanted to bring it up is because I was considering what did I want to talk about. And you know, I wanted to sort of stay with some of the stuff we talked about last time in terms of how to cultivate a kind of independence in one's practice that is not doesn't mean that you're not involved with people, with teachers or authorities or authoritative traditions, and yet offers not just a kind of protective quality where there's like a world of people who might be manipulating you and you stay on your toes. Yeah, that, that's true. That can be helpful. But it's almost more like how you begin to mature as a singular seeker or practitioner even in the midst of training, almost like you're on two tracks at the same time. Uh, and so this was very informative to me because it, a lot of it had to do with issues of surrender and authority. And surrender is, you know, a, can be a very important part of both psychedelic experience and spiritual practice uh, on, on many different levels. You know, you, you have difficult material come, come up and you surrender to it. You have a teacher ask you to do something you don't want to do. And I'm not going to say what that is. I'm not going to say you have a teacher who asks you, you know, to uh, give them a back rub or a teacher who asks you to, uh, you know, start to work out or, or, or do uh, Tai Chi every day and you don't want to do that, you know, in a way, I'm not getting into the details. I'm just saying that in a relationship with a teacher, sometimes they ask you to do something and you're like, well, I can, I don't want to do that. I don't feel that this is right for me. Or you just surrender. You're okay. I'm just going to do that. I'm going to trust. I'm not even going to trust necessarily the teacher's right. I'm just going to trust the situation that I can experiment with not doing what I want. So this this quality of autonomy that I'm interested in is not the autonomy of I know what I want. It's the kind of autonomy that allows you to trust to go into a situation where you don't know. So it, 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 there's an element of risk in it. And yet I think that by cultivating that, you actually develop a better sense of when this, oh wait, no, this is something I really don't want. Because you know you can go along with it up to a certain point. As opposed to, I think a lot of people, they, they can just begin to surrender and then that's it. They're like, okay, just tell me what to do. And I, a lot of people want that on some level. I think on some level, we all want it. to finally like let go of responsibility, to have, to, to luck out and be in a situation where the person who's telling us what to do is right. And we can just like go with it and be like, whew, I'm done. You know, at least in the context of, of spiritual work or 
or a psychedelic session. And I'm not, I, you know, I'm not so sure about how, how valuable that is. I'm sure at points there may be. And I'm enough of a, what would you call it? I don't want to say anarchist, a free thinker, a don't know guy to find it difficult to judge other people's decisions. And certainly there are people who, you know, you could even like, let's just take a cult, right? It's a, just no argument about it. I mean, some religious scholars, well, we don't like the word cult. It's an alternative religious group. And cult is a negative term that people from the outside use to describe situations that people find uncomfortable. But from the inside, it has a different kind of quality. I'm not saying that. I'm saying like it's a cult. And, and yet people go through cults and they come out okay. I mean, I met people like that. They're like, I remember this, this uh, poet named Sparrow who lived in uh, the Lower East Side and then he moved, moved upstate. Uh, and and, and I, I was talking once, I would go, hey man, what, what was your life like around here before? And he goes, oh yeah, my wife, my wife and I spent the 70s in cults. <laughs> you know, and it was, she was in a sex cult, he was in some Hare Krishna cult. And they went through it and then, then it was over. And it was kind of weird, but it was kind of like interesting or something, or they learned something. Now, there might have been the next guy over who had a terrible time and came out damaged, traumatized, you know, for the rest of their life or something they never could get over. And I, I'm not saying that that's not valid or his experience is valid. I'm just saying that it's hard to judge beyond a certain kind of point. And we're in an age when those kinds of judgments are made like that with tremendous repercussions uh, because of the sort of social climate. And I don't wanna to spend too much time on that social climate and how it's changed and why it's changed. I'm happy to talk about it if people wanna have more questions about it. Obviously it's a big part of our, part of our lives. If I, I'm gonna assume that most of us are kind of progressive in some way, kind of on the left in some way, if not, no big deal, you know, I've got some libertarian in me, but uh, we, we'll find that in various ways, the communities that we're in, the discourse networks we're in, have a quality of like hyper judgment, almost a kind of mob judgment going on that, um, you know, again, it's like complicated issue. There's a lot to say about it. And it's not exactly what I'm talking about, but I, I, I am saying that it's really kind of hard to know especially if you are allowing yourself to explore and not necessarily be safe all the time because you can't i don't think you can be a seek really be a seeker or real really be a psychedelic person and be safe all the time you know and a lot of people don't want that to be the case a lot of people even if they kind of think it is the case don't want to say that don't want to make it part of the shtick uh, if you're selling psychedelics, you don't want to say like, yeah, these things can be a little unsafe, but they are a little unsafe. You can, you can uh, temporarily lose your mind. You can be traumatized. And I just mean from the experience, not in terms of relating to other people. And, but on the reverse of that is that if you take kind of responsibility for your own risk taking, I believe you're, you're, you're actually better off. Whereas people who don't take responsibility, who don't develop a certain kind of autonomy that's willing to let go, an autonomy that's willing to let go, a kind of not knowing that maintains a coherence, I think it's actually easier to, to get messed up. Now, I'm not saying there aren't situations that people need to avoid, but I'm raising all this in a way because, and I'll get to a couple other issues, you know, I'm, I think it might be an interesting thing to talk about in our own experiences or problems we've gotten into or ways you disagree with me. And, and believe me, I, I recognize there are, there are, you know, somebody's like, no, I was in this situation. <laughs> they, they abused me. I'm like, yeah, it sounds like they abused you. I'm not saying that people who have those experiences or those kinds of stories are wrong. I'm saying that in this world of investigation, exploration, especially when you're moving outside of the norm and you're not following like a set path, that there's, a, there's an element of risk and how we negotiate that is really important. Another feature I've been talking about autonomy is peer-to-peer -peer relationships. Peer-to-peer -peer spirituality is totally key. 
Or another way of thinking about it is spiritual friendships. Your friend, like your friends, they sometimes have authority. They know more than you do about certain things. They know you in ways that you don't always want to acknowledge. So that you know, you, how many people who have good friends will say, you know, you do that thing and you're like, no, I don't. And you're like, well, yeah, yeah. Your friend's telling you that because they see something in you. And that quality of friendship, a peer to peer, a horizontal kind of relationship is a wonderful balance for explorations that involve in other contexts, more traditional forms of authority. So if you're in, you have a teacher, but then you're like talking to your spiritual friend who doesn't have that teacher about what's going on. And you're like, wow, that, that thing's kind of uncomfortable to talk about then. And your friend's going, what? Wait, what did they ask you to do? And you're like, oh, okay, that actually helps. And even leaving aside whether or not you have a more traditional teacher or teaching or group that you are committed to, uh, just having spiritual friends alone like that's your path is I have, I have shifting crews <coughs> of spiritual friends is a highly under discussed resource or approach to these things. I don't think it's enough necessarily for a whole life. Or I should say that there that I think in order for it to be really rich and dynamic, there need to be things that are sort of like spiritual friend mentors. You know, one of the things when I was trying to think about this, I mean, I was thinking my personal life, meeting people who were slightly older, who had been around the block, but were not my teachers, not my teachers. They were my friends, but they were older and they knew more and they taught me a lot. They taught me about Tai Chi, they taught me about cooking, they taught me about how to handle emotions. You know, they, there, was, there, there was an element of teaching in the situation, but the context was friendship, not authority, not teaching with a capital T. And one of the models of this I think of is kind of like people's older siblings or even older siblings of friends, you know, when you're like 10 years old and then your friend has like an older brother and he's kind of a jerk to you, but he also go, Hey, come here. Like, look, let me show you how to like make explosives or let me show you about my computer or let me show you. No, no, no. Don't listen to that crap. Here's the velvet underground or whatever it is that that kind of relationship again is not, it's not that authority line. It's another way in that's uh, has a different kind of angle and it kind of invites you up and in rather than just, to repeat or to just take it. Um, and I think that the Dharma not spirit is part about that peer to peer relationship uh, and developing and nurturing spiritual friends, which is also a great way to have friends. I mean, I've been very lucky in my life where um, I mean, I've disappointed with certain things about my life and things I've done and not done. But I've always put, it, put a good amount of attention on cultivating friends with people I really think are worth that effort. And so I have a lot of very long running friendships that have a spiritual quality, uh, a kind of, you know, band of brothers and sisters kind of quality to it um, that is in a lot of ways much more valuable to me than the spiritual teachers I've had, which I've also had. Uh, and I just, we just don't hear about it enough. And so I think it's really important and good to cultivate those kinds of relationships uh, in, in a spiritual sense, but it's also really key for psychedelics because I still believe that the best way to take, you know, moderate to large doses of psychedelics is, well, I guess if it's a large and scary dose, it's nice to have somebody in the room who's not, not high, uh, but it's best to have that person be your friend. And if you're all gonna like roll the dice, then do it with your friends. Be in a room, be in a house together over the weekend or go out to the, to the woods, have a basket of you know, tea and fruit and some you know, blankets to throw on the ground 
you know, have a whistle so you can all wander off and then somebody blows a whistle and you all come back together again at, a, at an arranged point. Like for me, like that's so much obviously superior to working with a therapist in a, in a room by yourself and to some degree, even in a kind of organized psychedelic ritual. I like ritual structures. I, I think ayahuasca is particularly well served by a ritual structure where there is a kind of facilitator or leader. So I think it does sort of partly depend on the compound and what you're doing. But again, I just don't hear it. I don't hear people saying, hey, you're interested in exploring psychedelics or you're interested in exploring like intense spiritual practice. Develop a coterie of spiritual friends. Why? I don't get it. I don't get it. Instead, is I'll oh, find a teacher or increasingly these days a method. Because we are in, in some ways, a post teacher era. You know, it's like we look back at the 60s and 70s, especially the 70s, the time of gurus. You have the guru figures and then they do their abuses <laughs> and then people go, this sucks, we don't want this anymore. But you can't just sort of, it's hard to really just do it on your own. Some people can, but most of us need teachers at points. So then it's like, well, how do I frame, how do we do the teacher thing? And one way is to put a lot of rules and, and control systems to keep the teacher at bay, you know, which takes some of the fun out of it, to my, in my view, or makes it more formulaic or makes it more uh, institutionalized. Um, or you, it's more about the method. And you see this a lot in contemporary meditation stuff where it's really, it's not so much like, like Chula Dasa, cool guy, right? You know, and some people thought he was like super spiritual. And so when he, when he, they found out he, that he was, you know, stupping shtup, prostitutes, they freaked out and they were like, I thought he had achieved the highest level of enlightenment where one is no longer able to commit such acts. And you're like, geez, guys, get a clue. <laughs> I mean, this is a human being we're talking about. But it, in a way, it doesn't matter because he was a cool guy and he wrote a really good book that had a good system in it. And people could use the system and tons of people have used the system, the, the mind illuminated. And it's a great, it's very clear. And so you, in a way, you don't really need the teacher. You just need someone who's able to lay out a system and give you some feedback and you can kind of go for that. And that's cool too. But again, I think without the spiritual friend, there's something autistic about it, or and I mean that in, not to put uh, something negative on autistic people, but just on this, there's some kind of like way in which that undermines some of the multidimensional quality, the relational quality, the, uh, the, the balance of, of personal independent work and collective interpersonal work that comes along with the cultivation of uh, of good friends along the path. So part about being a Dharma knot or a psycho knot is that in a way, yeah, it's you out there in that space and you're learning your tricks and techniques. You've got your mantras, your sage stick, your mental moves, whatever the things are that you've developed. So in some sense, you're, 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 uh, you know, you're a freelancer, but there's always a context in a community uh, around that, or not always, but there, there, there can be if there should be if there can be. Some people don't have that, and they're they're doing this stuff alone, and they're in some small town, and they don't have any friends, and this is still what they're doing. I'm not saying that they shouldn't do it, uh, but obviously today there's all these different ways of making connections and making friendship. But in my experience, and here I may just simply be dating myself. The kinds of relationships I'm talking about are, are not, e not as easy to develop in a predominantly online kind of environment. Um, they involve, in a way, shared uh, trials, you know, and that's why tripping with your friends is such an interesting thing to do because it's inevitably a trial sometimes, but it's shared in a way that builds bonds that are just as valuable and in some ways I think even more valuable than the bonds one can build with a, an illuminating teacher. So I, that was kind of the riff that I wanted to do and I, I'm going to put put in the links to this story and it's definitely worth reading because there's some very it's it's some, excuse me important stuff to to consider especially if we're interested in psychedelic therapy um, and to pay attention to some of the dark sides of therapy and and some of the problems that have already already come up. 
um, but it seemed like a good sort of way way into this topic. And I'm kind of curious whether this resonates with people, uh, people's own experiences of authority. I mean, that's one thing I haven't talked too much about is just with this attitude, it, it does let you still have a teacher. Like I have a teacher right now, but I didn't have one for like 20 years, you know, or almost, you know, like 18 years. You know, I had teachers who were doing certain things, but I didn't have like a capital T teacher, which I do now but in a very different way because of all the time I've spent not having a teacher. Um, so it's not about like, no, the teacher model's over. No, it's don't ever give yourself over to somebody else. Don't ever give yourself over to an idea. Don't ever give yourself over to, it's not that. It's not that. It is about developing the autonomy to risk in certain circumstances, recognizing that you might be wrong. You know, that's part of what, that's what real risk is uh and i'm sure there are ways to go through spiritual life and psychedelic life without real risk i don't know exactly what they look like uh and and so i think it's it's good to develop multiple ways of handling um certain kinds of risk uh through your own development and your development of uh friendships so i want to open it up we're going to stop recording